Good morning, good morning. Welcome to See Me Covenant Church. Uh, we're glad you're here this morning. If you would stand with us as we begin worship. Sing us out together. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of the Savior, the hope of Take me as you find me. So take me as you find me. All my fears and failures. Fill my life again. I give my life to follow. Everything I believe in. Now I serve. He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, heroes and conquer the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So shine your light and let the whole world see. Good morning, and we are glad that you're here with us this morning. I was going to say, uh, as a reminder, we've got coffee and donut holes in the back, but I think for the first song we were singing, pretty much half of y'all were already back there, so I think you found it. All right, but if you do need a little extra water, coffee, hot cocoa, anything like that, that back corner's for you. We want you to feel like uh, you're at home in this place, and uh, whether you got here 
20 minutes earlier, whether you rolled out of bed at 9.15 and barely got in this door, uh, we're so glad that you're here with us this morning and glad that you uh, chose to worship with us this morning. So uh, let's continue in worship, sing, Whom Shall I Fear? You hear me when I call, you are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. Who shall I fear? You crush the enemy underneath my feet. You are my sword and shield. No troubles linger still. Who shall I fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever. He is a friend of mine. It's always by my side. And my strength is in your name, for you alone can save. You will deliver me, yours is the victory. Who shall I fear? Who shall Good morning. I'm going to be reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, 
It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall command his angels concerning you, and whoops, and they will lift <clears throat> you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answers him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for the privilege that we have to come here to worship you. And we thank you for the words that you're about to give Pastor Kurt um, for us this morning so that we may uh, have open ears and open heart uh, to be able to get out into the world and to make a difference in the world and to be a good witness for you. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. My name is Kurt, and this last week, I was asked a question by a guy named Bentley. So Bentley, I'd like you to come up here. Come on up. I, we want, uh, here, we'll use this one, we'll share this one, how's that? Um, so come on up here, Bentley, have a seat. So uh, we all have questions. And I love it that our kids have questions and they feel like they can talk to me, ask me questions. Sometimes they stump me. That's okay, too. So tell me a little bit about yourself. First, give us your name. What grade are you in? My name's Bentley. I am in fourth grade. Great. Awesome. All the fourth graders out there. All right. Uh, so he's, he specified, I would like to ask you this question, Pastor Kurt, and I would like to ask it to you in front of the congregation. What we're hoping is that he's going to ask me the same question he asked me earlier. All right, go, go ahead. What was your question? What made you want to believe God? Okay. So what made me want to believe in God, or even believe God? That's a, that's a, there's a deep one, if we would take that one. So what makes me want to believe in God? So if, if you are reading the book along with us, a book on Christian essentials that's going along with the sermon series that we're going through right now, one of the things that, uh, that is talked about in chapter 2 about grounded in the Word was specifically that God shares about himself in several different ways. So what I told you, I already t answered your question right to your face, so I'll tell in front of everybody else. So the thing for me personally, when I was about 17, I was trying to decide if I wanted to believe in God. I grew up Catholic. I grew up going to church all the time. And I thought, do I really believe that there is a God? And I'm not sure if I want to keep... I could foresee a situation where I would go to church and not believe in God. And I thought, that's not right. Uh, so do I believe in God? And I started to think about uh, the world that was around me, that there was actually a world. And I was learning that, hey, the, 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 there was this idea of the, the beginning of the universe. And I thought, if there was some kind of Big Bang, if there was a, a beginning of the universe, there had to be someone who started it. And that kind of scared me a little bit, to tell you the truth. I said, I don't know what that God is like, but there is a God. And so that was the beginning for me in my journey. And so when we think about our own life with God, there are many things that testify to God's presence. It can be uh, because there's a world around us that's beautiful. Uh, we also think about the, the way that people uh, see morality in the world that testifies to what God is. And we also have God's Word as well. So I learned a lot about who God is then from the Bible. That was how I ended up learning more about it. What about you? Where, where, do you want to answer that question yourself? Have you, have you decided yet whether you think you, or you don't want me to ask you that question in front of everybody? I can ask you. Um, how, how, how have you decided that you believe in God? So how I believe in God is because uh, we have earth, and how did people come in the world because of God, and how did plants become God? 
All right, so God is behind giving us material things, all this, the world that we see. That's great. Thank you very much for asking that question. And I like the persistence because this morning he said, so am I going to get to ask my question, right? So I appreciate that. I like that. Uh, okay, un, uh, unscripted question. Uh, what church did you go to? Ooh, good question. Um, when I was a little kid or later on? Uh, when I was a little kid, I went to Catholic Mass every week with my mom. So my dad did not want to go with us. And uh, when I was in college, I started going to a covenant church, and I was baptized in a covenant church when I was in college. I went to other churches as well. Uh, but now I go to see me covenant church pretty regularly. <laughs> yeah. All right, thanks, man. All right, nice to John Bentley. Milana, it's up to you. Coming from the pits. Good morning. How is everyone today? Good, good, good. Um, I'm going to be doing your announcements today. Do you want to come say hi? You could come say hi. <laughs> I had a feeling this might happen. You want to say hi? I need this. Okay. You want to do the? Do you want to do the announcements today? No. Okay. Okay. Um, announcements. We should probably do that, right? Okay. Um, so tonight is the hangout in the alley. Uh, everyone is welcome. Uh, the alley is in Moore Park. Uh, there's a lot of fun things to do there. We normally congregate um, kind of in the alley. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, and that'll be at 5. Uh, between 5 and 7, you're more than welcome to uh, bring your own food. They also offer food there. Um, there's a brewery and a winery, so it's a, a lot of fun. Um, kids camp registration opened up uh, this past week. We already have, I don't know, like 40 kids signed up. So very, very exciting things. It's going to be from uh, June 24th to the 28th. Um, we are also uh, have a form up for volunteers too. We need, need volunteers. We can have lots of kids, but if we don't have anybody to take care of them, then we, we can't have camp. <laughs> um, and... Last call for the men's retreat. That's going to be the 18th to the 21st of April. So in just a couple weeks, if you guys are interested, uh, we have about 20 guys going. So uh, I pray that you guys um, further your relationships with each other and with God. Um, <laughs> and the week after that will be the women's tea on the 27th. Um, yes. The women are working really, really hard at getting everything together. It's going to be a lot of fun. I believe it starts at 10. Um, and tickets are going to be sold in the back by Wendy Bashar. It's 35 for an adult. And then if you're under 15, it's $25. Other than that, uh, save the date. We've got our camping trip coming up June 14th to the 16th. Um, and then next week, we also have our hospitality brainstorming session after church um, on the 14th. If you're interested, there is an email you can um, say that you're interested so we can make sure we have enough lunch for you. I think that's it. Are you ready to go to bed? No. no. Okay. That is it. <laughs> oh, yes. You need to go to Sunday school. Yay. All right, kids, go to Sunday school. All right, so as the kids uh, run off and make their way to Sunday school, if you all, the rest of you all, just stand with us as we continue in worship. song we haven't sung in here in a very long time, but I thought it'd be appropriate this morning. Sing this out. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the King of my heart 
sing this out together. Oh, praise the one. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. sing one last song uh, before Kirk comes up. And uh, as we do, it's a, this is an, an older song, and um, I think it really speaks to this, this one element uh, of what we do. Uh, we, we come together on, on Sunday mornings, and we do this thing called worship, right? And I think sometimes what worship means can get changed, because we usually think of worship as, okay, what we do when we're singing, Right, that, that, that that's what defines worship. But really that's just one very small aspect of it. Uh, what we really design and what we desire is that on these mornings, the, the truth of who God is and what God's called us to gets communicated to us in so many different ways on a Sunday morning. From the way that we interact with each other and the way that you greet your friends or greet people you've never met before. Uh, from, from that, all the way to Bible verses that get read, to songs that we sing, to uh, messages that get preached. Those are all aspects of what it means for us to worship together. And uh, I was actually talking with um, a member of our congregation, Lynn, and we were talking about this, this idea of, you know, sometimes we'll play a song and we don't really know what to do afterwards. The song ends and it's like, do we, do we clap? Do we not clap? Is it okay to clap? Is, is clapping wrong? And what, what I always think of is uh, when we are, are making music, what we're doing here, these songs are not to be uh, a performance. They're not to be a, um, you know, this isn't like a, a little concert that happens every Sunday morning. Music is one of those ways that we understand things about who God is and we understand truths about God in a way that we might not otherwise. I mean, we could stand up here and just read these lyrics and just read them down, but they might not communicate the same thing. Or sometimes we'll have songs that we play where the song will repeat one line over and over again for a while. And it, sure, you kind of get the picture, you get the message when you read it the first time, but there's something sometimes about repeating a line in a song that makes our imagination go and think about what does that mean? Like we were singing this song earlier, you were good, you were good, oh. You know, that's a pretty simple lyric. You get it pretty quickly. But if we can let our minds kind of circle around while we're singing that lyric and we're singing to God that you are good, and we repeat that, our imagination gets to fill that line with, with pictures of ways that we've seen God be good in our lives. Or it could be filled with questions of, is this actually true? Do I really believe this? Because everything in my experience seems to be pointing a different direction right now. Um, so that's, that's what... We, what, what we're doing really when we sing worship together is we're getting a chance to experience God and experience community by singing together and experience truth in a way that's different than when we're just reading it or when we're hearing uh, Kurt preach it, for instance. So uh, all that goes to say um, we're going to sing this song, Heart of Worship, which is really about that. And I encourage us to use this song as a time to prepare our hearts, quiet our hearts, and be ready to hear uh, Kurt's message this morning. And then also, uh, just as a you know, thing that maybe doesn't need to be said, but when we clap and hear after a song, don't worry. Like, no, no one up here is worried that we're going to get a big head because y'all are clapping for us, because that's not what it's about. It's about 
us celebrating together um, the, the truths of the love of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God that we all get to come together and experience and remind each other of on Sunday morning. So, um, so if we ever finish a song and you hear someone like starting to clap and you don't know, is it okay? Is it, do, go for it. You know, go for it. And you also don't have to. It's that uh, we're, our egos are also not fragile enough that if you guys, we play a song and it's a very contemplative song afterwards, you don't feel like you don't have to clap to, uh, to give us a thing. For a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus And I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it When it's all about you it's all about you, Jesus. A kingdom in this world, no one could express how much you deserve. can take a seat. <laughs> you can count on you, Kelly, to stir. That's good. <laughs> I, I know that, uh, for the over 70 crowd, you don't tend to use the word triggered too much, but was that triggering for you for him to call a song from 1999 an oldie? I'm just curious. I'm just curious. Okay. It is older than some of the people in the room. Let's just remember that. It's older than a lot of people in the room. It is a bit of an oldie for some. Yeah. <laughs> on Sunday mornings right now, we are in a message series called Christian Essentials. Uh, just like there are essential items for a vacation that we would take or go on, there are essential items that you and I need for the journey of Christian faith. Uh, we want these things for ourselves. We need to have them. Uh, we also want other people in our faith community to have those items with them when they proceed in faith. For example, if you were to leave your toothbrush behind on a trip, 
even if you might be willing to go without it, your travel companions would want you to have it with you and are willing to make sure that you have it. To them, you having a toothbrush is a travel essential. <laughs> so as we go through this series, we, we, we want to concentrate on applying it to ourselves first. That's the key thing. We shouldn't spend all of our energy thinking about, oh, somebody else needs to hear this. We want to think first about ourselves. But we can think as well about how we want to encourage other people to uh, have these essentials with them as they journey in faith. We're phrasing these Christian essentials in a way that we will say, hey, a Christian person is someone who, and last week the first essential that we said is a, a Christian person is someone who is saved by grace. Uh, as Christians, we recognize that people are beautiful, but also somewhat brutish, or as we said it last week, we are capable of grandeur and garbage sometimes at the same time. And because of sin, we, are, we were naturally excluded from life with God, but God intervened, and it's only because of God's action and his goodness to us to reconcile us back to himself that we are able to have life in him. And so we didn't deserve it. He did it. That's what grace is. And, and that grace shapes the way that we understand who God is and how we understand who we are, and it ends up shaping even our own identity. It defines who we are. So today we come to our second essential, which is this. A faithful Christian is someone who is centered on Scripture. And we have a passage, a key passage, that deals with that is in 2 Timothy 3. I don't have any slides today, so you'll just have to open your Bible, open your Bible app, or listen along as you read in 2 Timothy chapter 3. There is a, if you have a Bible with you, you know there's always a, a table of contents in the front. It can help you get there. 2 Timothy 3, and we're going to start in verse 13. He's kind of mid-sentence, but we'll start here uh, in 13. While evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. And how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let's pray. Father, we ask you to... Help us to focus in on that word that you're talking about here, to understand it, to apply it rightly in our lives, not, not just this week, but really on throughout our lives. May your Holy Spirit speak to us as we hear your word today or reflect more on it so that Christ will be magnified. We'll see him for as good as he is. We, we worship you, the triune God, who gives us life. And has given us his word, your word as well. So thank you for your word. May we meditate on that this morning. We pray in your name. Amen. Okay, this passage in 2 Timothy is part of a letter that a guy named Paul wrote to a young man named Timothy. Uh, Paul has invested in this guy, Timothy, and he has given him responsibilities overseeing ministry, and, and Paul wants to encourage him in his work. This is thought of as Paul's last letter of his life. He wants to really encourage him and pass it on. And when we kicked off in here, Paul is reminding Timothy that there are some people who are kind of bad eggs. While evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. So there's, there's people who are bad, and they're going from bad to being even worse. And they're, they're not only deceived themselves, but they're deceiving others as well. And he uses that to challenge Timothy to say, that's, that's not the direction I want you to go in. Verse 14, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of. Continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of. So he, he wants him to continue. Uh, things that we have learned, there's a, an aspect of our life where we have been convinced of things. And he says, keep going in that direction. I want you to be faithful. I want you to be a faithful person. So you learn these things, you become convinced of them. So keep going in that direction. Be faithful. 
a key difference in the life of a faithful person is that rather than being deceived, rather than being someone who is deceiving, a faithful person is someone who's going to be centered on Scripture, and he's going he's gonna to rotate around that in this passage for us. There are a lot of people who will use the Bible as a prop for their own program to go where they want to go, but I see three aspects here that if we keep those things on the forefront... It's going to guard us from this fate of deceiving or being deceived. So he's going to say that a faithful Christian applies biblical principles to their life today, remembers the main point of the Bible, and third is mastered by the Scriptures. Applies biblical principles in their life, remembers the main point, and is mastered by the Scriptures. All right, first one. We're going to apply biblical principles to life today. Verse 15, he says, The Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation. So he ends up tying this idea of wisdom to the scriptures. And you and I, we, we want to be people who are wise. We want to, to know what is the right thing to do or to say and to actually do it. That's kind of the definition of wisdom. Sometimes to know the right thing not to say or the not to do as well. That's what a wise person does. A wise person lives their life like they should. That's the idea. So we're saying that when we apply the biblical principles to our life today, one of the first things is, is we should note when we say as we should that there is a truth claim that is there. We could ask, well, who gets to decide what the should is? Who is it that gets to say what that sh should is? As Christians, we maintain that it is the Bible that determines our principles and that we should follow them. In the 21st century, though, in the greater L.A. area, our secular friends will view faith as oftentimes as dangerous, definitely as a private thing, though. They see it really kind of like somebody else's underwear. I don't necessarily want to think about yours, and I certainly don't want to see it, right? That's... So the increasing message around us is that there are some people who have faith and there are some people who don't, and that's just kind of the situation as it is. Uh, and the way that this ties to this idea of wisdom is that uh, we, if someone becomes a follower of Jesus, there's, there's some pressure for that person to maintain the kind of default view of the world that we, those are just the camps. Some people have that gift and some people don't. Uh, to put, and so there's this pressure to put a spiritual life into kind of one slice of the pizza of our lives. That's the, that's the faith pizza slice is what we want. And a lot of our friends and neighbors think that just that, that faith slice of their lives is just empty. There's nothing, there's nothing in that spot. But that's actually not the case. Uh, when, when Christians, when we say that we follow biblical truth, uh, my secular friends would say, hey, you know what? No one should make truth claims. Nobody should do that. Uh, I hear that a lot. The problem is, when somebody says that, that's actually a truth claim. We say, you sh no one should make a truth claim is actually a truth claim. And they're claiming, they're saying, you should follow this way, and that's what everybody should think. So they're actually making a, a proposal or a proposition that everyone should follow the way that they're thinking. And that particular line of thinking is actually a very modern, certainly very more American way of thinking that isn't replicated in other places in the world. So what we're saying is the way that we think in 21st century Los Angeles is the right way, and everyone in the world should think the way that we think. It's a very powerful truth claim. And so if we're saying that God is something that should stick to the side, if someone says universal truth claims about God should be put to the side, or that there is no God, that is also a truth claim. So it's not that somebody else doesn't have a faith and that we do. There are competing claims, actually. And so that slice of pizza pie is actually filled. It's just filled with a very different view of the world. And that's, that's helpful for us to, to recognize that. It's, uh, th there is a faith slice in their pizza slice. They have a philosophy that informs their way of living, which is kind of the definition of what a religion is. Paul says that in these scriptures, these scriptures are able to make us wise for salvation. 
So it, it, the Christian claim is something big. It's about salvation. And in that sense, it's not just a, a very narrow sense of the word. It's not just going to heaven. It's a lot broader. Uh, the idea of salvation is, is welfare. It's prosperity. It's real security. So Paul's saying, actually, that the scriptures are able to give you the wisdom that will help you to live the good life. That's, that's a philosophical claim, and uh, you can challenge that. So that's fine. Uh, but this is giving us a picture of how to achieve the good life. And in the world around us, they also have uh, a picture of the good life. It's a competing claim for what that would look like. So if we're going to be wise, Paul says, we should live into the wisdom that God gives us. And that's going to be an ongoing battle for us. I, I am always tempted by the way that the world talks about what the good life should be. Well, if we are going to uh, live into that, to apply these biblical principles to our life, we're saying it is a, a philosophy, it competes with the world around us, and we're, but we are meant to live into that truth in our world today. Uh, some people will say uh, that you can make Scripture say whatever you want. Uh, it is true that people can quote Scripture and say what they want. <laughs> uh, that's different. We, a moment ago, Mariana read from Matthew 4, where Satan himself quotes Scripture. So that is possible. Uh, but we can only make Scripture say what we want by twisting its meaning or going against the main point of a passage. Uh, in this passage that we read today, the main point is about sending our lives on Scripture. If we're going to we're going to need to do some work, usually, to understand the main point, the main thrust of Scripture. But then we're, the extra work is then to say, hey, how does this apply to our lives today? So he, if we're going to be wise, if we're, this wisdom is going to lead us into salvation, we need to be wise about living our life. We don't want to have it say whatever we want. We want to try to apply it, though, in practical ways. So the Bible is primarily about people and our relationship with God, our relationship with each other. It's about facing temptations. It's about difficulties and the pain of life. It's calling us to God, calling us to real life, to salvation in the midst of that. And, and so even if we know that this is an ancient book, we can know that the wisdom that we find in there is timeless because it's dealing with people, and people are still people. So the scriptures are applicable to us. They're applicable to our lives today. And, and he's calling you and me to apply this word to our lives in Simi Valley today. And we can know, we can apply the scriptures to this moment in our life, in our singleness. We can ap apply these scriptures at this moment in our life, in our marriage. We can apply it in our searching for a job. We can apply it for this time in our school life, at this moment in your career, this moment in our retirement. But because it is an ancient book, it may not always speak directly to the situation that we have. But we can apply biblical principles. And that's what we're talking about. A, a faithful person is going to apply biblical principles to their life today. For example, the Bible does not say anything about AI. But there are important implications in the biblical message about how humans are made in God's image how we can, apply, uh, we can apply this as students or employees as well about truth-telling. I think that there are questions for us about that, and we can try to work out the implications for that. Uh, biblical authors did not know anything about digital pornography, but it does talk about how we as followers uh, of God or just as human beings can be really easily duped by counterfeits in the world. There are principles for us about talking about giving our lives to sexual wholeness. So there are principles in Scripture that we can apply to this area to live faithfully. Uh, the biblical authors did not live in a world with liberty or any democracy, actually. So the entire New Testament was written during the time of the empire of Rome. So there's not a specific vo uh, verse telling us who to vote for, but there are biblical principles about how to live faithfully when our values are not reflected in society. It tells us that we should be praying for our leaders and whoever that might be. It tells us how we should specifically interact with other believers who we don't always agree with. So acting in uncharitable ways toward our brothers and sisters, that one very clearly is a no-no. 
The challenge then is that how do we disagree in a way that honors God and demonstrates something different than the toxic atmosphere that we find around us in the world? That's the challenge for us. So the question is, is how should we apply this word today? We should apply it to our lives. There are timeless principles in the word, and we need to do the work then to figure out how to apply that to our daily lives. All right, secondly, the, the reality is sometimes we as Christians, we are going to disagree about the way that other believers uh, make ethical decisions. As faithful Christians, we have to return again and again to the main things. And that's our second point. A faithful Christian, secondly, remembers the main point of the Bible. He says, these holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The wisdom that is in the Bible points to God's revealed word, Christ Jesus, this one who became man, took on flesh. In other words, scripture, he says, these words point toward Christ Jesus. And that means that scripture is salvation-oriented, and in particular, it's Christ-centered. We, we've said before that actually the Old Testament scriptures look forward to what God was going to be doing, and it points to this Savior who was going to come. And everything in the New Testament points back and says there was a Savior who came. So at the center of all Scripture, there is a, a cross shape that the Old and New Testaments point to this one who came. And the whole reflection is what are the implications for that? What does that say about who God is? What does that mean about who we are? What does that mean for the world? So everything that we talked about last week about how we are saved by grace, that is the main point of the Bible. It's all about who is Christ and what does that mean for the world? That we are people who can't save ourselves, but we need God to intervene. It's accessible. And since, since there is a, a main point to the Bible, the, the, there is minutia that is very difficult to understand at times, but the main message is very accessible to everyone. He says, he says verse 15, how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures. Uh, I just, I just want to say, as, a, as an aside, Timothy is somebody who grew up as a Christian. Uh, sometimes people who grew up in a Christian background, they think, oh, I don't have as much of a story. Hey, this is a leader in the church. He's, a, he's somebody who has a story to talk about God's faithfulness. But I love it. He says, how from infancy you've known the Holy Scriptures. Scripture is accessible even to infants. Uh, for us, as a church, we're, we're committed to sharing the message of Christ to the next generation. Uh, we want to make sacrifices even in order that they will uh, be able to understand for that to be able to happen. Uh, as a church, we dedicate resources to children's ministry. A lot of you volunteer in children's ministry, uh, but we also, uh, a portion of our giving goes towards staffing, uh, toward doing things like renovating rooms. We are almost done with our baby care room over there. It'll be really nice for uh, mothers or, uh, who want to nurse. If somebody needs to give a bottle to a baby over there, we can. Uh, that's a wonderful place, quiet place to be. Uh, so we, we wanted to do that. There's, there's, we want to invest in our kids. We want to accept as well sometimes that things get a little bit broken on campus because we have kids as well. That's part of our investment in having, uh, investing in them. Uh, so that, that's part of what we accept that's part of investing in kids. As parents, we want to invest in the spiritual lives of our kids with the same sort of intensity that we have in making sure that they do their homework or for us investing in their sports clubs. We want to prioritize their faith. For a lot of parents, so I'll say, uh, we, we see oftentimes how much spiritual growth we, we need when we want to start investing in our kids. I, mean, I don't know if that was the case for you. You, you, start, you think, hey, I kind of got this Christian thing down, and then your kid comes along and asks you a question like Bentley did to me, and you think, oh my gosh, what do I think about that thing? And it might be something even more difficult than that. The primary place, I will say, for spiritual growth should be in the home. Uh, this, this, is a, this is a supplement for our faith here at, at church that we should be investing in our kids. And we should be, our, our kids primarily learn about what it means to follow Jesus from watching us. And that's kind of scary, actually, because we think, gosh, I, I don't know that much theology, and I, I'm not even a very good Christian. We want to help equip you as a parent 
or grandparents or as an invested adult in the life of a child, if you feel like you're struggling in the area of you don't know how you would, can invest in your kids, I will tell you that our, uh, I am happy to help you with that. Our children's ministry director, uh, Amanda, and our coordinator, Jen, I would love to help you with that. Our, our youth director, David, would like to help you to, to take those steps. So one thing you can do, if you, if you would like a little bit of help, I'll just say, uh, you want to learn a little bit more about Scripture, you want to grow, you, know what you can do is you can leave a note on one of those yellow sheets that's in there where you can fill out the QR code and say, hey, I'd, I'd love to, I, this is a question I have. I would like to know, or how should I have answered my kid about this thing? Why, why did, I spent a little more time thinking about that because we're saying this should be understandable to kids. Um, sometimes it's confusing to us, but I love the verse he says, you, you know who you learned this from. He says, you have become convinced of these things because you know who you learned it from. And, and let's think about in our lives. We put a lot of pressure on ourselves to be really amazing, but think about the people that you learned faith from. They were kind of regular people probably. Regular people who would teach you, show you faith, invite you to pray, uh, to invite you to come to church. These are regular believers, and, and you might be that person in the life of another person. The main point of Scripture is understandable to everyone. It does hold up to more research, though. It does, you can go deeper. You can go more profound. It, it, scripture is accessible to infants, but it can stand up to a lifetime of research. I, I like going to the beach. Uh, as a child, I could kind of understand the beach. I understand what it is. The sun, sand, family, getting to be there. Of course, I could always learn more about seasonal shifting of erosion patterns and things like that, or uh, to learn about um, biodiversity or fossil record or something like that. Uh, there's always more to learn. But, and hopefully the idea is if you learn more about those things, it helps you to appreciate the wonder of that place. Uh, but the beach is accessible to people on all levels. And the same thing is true of Scripture. It's accessible to us on many levels. So we, we can go much deeper, but we should never overcomplicate things and always remember that Christ is at the center. That leads us to the last point, is that we shouldn't ever think that we've actually mastered it at all. Third point, somebody who is faithful is someone who is mastered by the Scriptures. Uh, I've been in ministry for about 25 years in lots of different contexts. Uh, there are passages that I have read a lot of times. There are passages I've even taught on a lot of times. And it's funny, I, I remember the first time I got, uh, somebody gave me a Bible and I read through it. And I was just so amazed to be able to read these stories about Christ's life. But I think the second or third time I read those passages, I thought, you know what, I, I kind of know this stuff. I've heard this before. And there was a, there was a, I, it's probably kind of the peak of my arrogance in those passages was thinking, I, I already know this stuff. But there was a moment in there with that where I felt like I kind of had mastered those passages and I just knew them. And that's kind of a dangerous place to be. We are supposed to know the scriptures, but we are supposed to be mastered by them. And Paul gives us a couple reasons why we should be mastered by them. He says that it's, God's inspired word. He says, I lost my spot. <clears throat> All scripture is God-breathed, this is verse 16, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So it says that scripture is God-breathed. The, the authority that we have in the scriptures is that it's from God himself. And, and because it's God's inspired word, it has authority in our lives. God is speaking to us by them. The, the, this is the authority of God himself. The Bible was written by about 40 authors in three different languages over a period of about 1,500 years or so. So different phases of history, different cultures, people living in a lot of different places. But the Bible speaks with one coherent message and I think it's because God inspired it himself. So the scriptures, they, they do retain some of the culture and complexity of the personality of the people who, who wrote these words down. And, and we have to work to try to understand the historical context 
of those words. But the words have authority because God breathed life into them. He, he breathed life into them and makes them, makes them holy and set apart. It's the same language that God describes, actually, for what he did in, in, in our lives. That God, God breathed life into you and me. And because God has worked in my life, he put his Holy Spirit in me and in you, he has breathed in you and has made you holy as well. You and I who are normal people, suddenly God has made holy by his own work. And he did that through these scriptures. He, he breathed his life into them, made them have power, made them, uh, made them authoritative because of what he did. Uh, the Apostle Paul, uh, Peter agrees with that. He says this in 2 Peter. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about because of the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the, these writers retained who they, who they were, and yet God was speaking through them to us. If God breathed into these things, that means that they have some the power as well. And we, we see their power if we apply them in our daily lives. We should, we should put them into practice. Paul says that they are useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I, one word that just stood out for me in that, I want to say, I, I wonder if you see yourself as a servant of God. That God would say, you, you are my servant. You are my servant here in this word, world. And so if we're God's servants, how are we going to be equipped? How are we, how are we going to get what we need? Well, he says, here's what, you're going to ha- here's what I've given you for what you need. It's useful. It's profitable. It's beneficial for us in our life. And that's because of scriptures like this one here. It's why our denomination, we say that the scriptures are the only perfect rule for faith, life, and doctrine teaches us about God, teaches us about how to live our life, teaches us how to think about who God is. Fourth century Christian named John Chrysostom, that is a boss nickname, by the way, because his name was Golden Mouth. That's what Chrysostom means. Chrysostom, awesome. He says, I would be more like Kurt the Clumsy, um, if you saw what I did in my backyard yesterday. Okay. Um, so John Chrysostom says this, By Scripture, we may disprove what is false, be corrected, be brought to a right understanding, and be comforted and consoled. It's beautiful. We can come to Scripture for all those things. It challenges us. It comforts us. It consoles us. It teaches us to disprove what is false and be corrected. So we have to learn and respond. Scripture teaches us how to rightly think about ourselves and think about God. So we have to learn what it says. That's, that's the hard part, and we have to respond. We can change our mind about who we think God is, who we think we are, to reaffirm things that need to be uh, affirmed. Now, all of that comes back to this idea is that we never master the Scriptures, but we have to put ourselves under them to be mastered by them. I think it's helpful for us to think about uh, when, we, when we come during our time of worship, this is, never, this is never meant to be, whether in this church or any other church, where there should be a pastor who's telling you, really uh, telling you their thoughts, but really it should be for us to understand together what the scriptures say and seek to apply that to our lives, to put ourselves under it, me, myself included. You're a servant of God's word, and you should be equipped by it. I'll say, you know, it's pretty hard for us to pay attention to the scriptures, probably harder now than ever before. We're easily distracted. There's a lot of things that can distract us in this world. So we need to seek more places where we can hear the word. This this can't be the only place where we hear scripture in our world because we want the scriptures to be supreme. We want our lives to center around them. Uh, So we want it to shape what we think and what we do. We want God to tell us the direction we should go. All right, I, I want to brainstorm just for a second. We're coming toward the end, but I would like to hear from you a couple ideas. Uh, I, it wouldn't be very helpful for me to tell you ways for Scripture to in, shape your life. I would like to hear places where you feel like Scripture has 
influenced your life? What were some of the circumstances you were in when you were impacted by Scripture? Where, where were you when that happened? And you don't have to be real specific. It can be a, um, a general thing. I'll start by saying, I was in church when Scripture affected me. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious, where were some places where you've been when you feel like Scripture has spoken to you? Vicky. Bible study. Somebody said, I was at work. How did that happen at work? Kids. Ah, okay, yeah. Kids are like, you're all a bunch of sinners, you kids. Yeah, okay, that's good, yeah. Okay. Or kids even talking with you about Scripture or something. Yeah, that's cool. At a hospital. Yeah, sure. At a concert. Okay. Regular, uh, a non-Christian concert, Christian concert. Okay, Michael W. Smith. You know what? A friend is a friend forever. If the Lord is the Lord of them. Amen. In Brazil. Okay, that's good. At camp. Yeah, I've been impacted by Scripture at Christian camps. I've been in my car listening to the Bible or listening to a, a, a sermon or something like that. I've been really impacted. I can remember sometimes some place where I was. Like, oh, man, I was in front of Costco when I, you know. What about some other places? A testimony on television that somebody shared. Yeah, that's terrific. In nature, been in awe of God. In traffic, yes. 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 <laughs> on a walk, yeah. Sometimes we're thinking about Scripture. I, I'll, I'll tell you, it does help when I have some Scriptures memorized. Sometimes they just kind of bubble up when I'm out walking or listening to something, right? Going through, anxiety. Going through anxiety. In my moments of anxiety, yeah, when something, they say, God, I need you in this moment. Grandparenting, Grandparenting yes. Or, or even parenting adult children, right? That calls for a different kind of faith than it did when our kids were younger. Yeah, right? I'm not there yet, but I've heard. How's that? That's what my dad tells me. Yeah. <laughs> Ginger. M lyrics of music. Yeah, listening to music. That's terrific. There are a lot of places. Oh, in the back, Mariana. In the choir in high school. That's right. High school choirs have shaped a lot of people's lives. I love that. I, I, I have been shaped so much by music and singing along with it. I remember when I was first a follower of Jesus, I thought, oh, man, this is the, the best ever. I could sing scripture uh, I remember, uh, in particular, rel relative to this one, that I learned that word, thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And I would sing that one. It's so simple, um, but I, I could remember that. All right, so there are a lot of places where we can interact with Scripture. We want it to impact our lives. If our lives are going to be centered on Scripture, it can't just be Sunday only. It needs to be in all these different places where we're finding ways to allow Scripture to impact our lives. Uh, we want it to shape who we are. And so we're going to need to be creative about trying to find ways to get it in us so that we can reflect on it a bit more. So faithful Christians are going to be people of the word. We're going to apply the biblical principles to our life today. We're going to remember the main point of Scripture, and we're going to be mastered by the Scriptures. We're not bringing our own agenda. We want it to tell us how we should think. Uh, I've been thinking this week about something that we need to do to, to move more toward being centered on Scripture. Maybe some of those gave you some ideas there. Or maybe we need to think this week, what is a way for me to be more centered on Scripture? Does, does the pattern of my life testify that faithful Christians need the Bible? Like the Word of God. Humans shall not live by bread alone, Jesus quoted, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. One symbol that might be helpful for you, um, I have this week's verse printed on a little sh green sheet like this. I would like to encourage you to think about grabbing one of these on the way out and maybe putting it on your bathroom mirror uh, someplace you're going to see it regularly, maybe not across your rearview mirror, um, but um, put it on your bathroom mirror or something like that. Put it someplace where you're going to see it to say, maybe just for this week. It doesn't need to be there forever. Uh, but to say, I, I want to be able to think about Scripture, to pray through these words. Maybe you need to find some other way. W ask God, what does it mean for me to be shaped by Scripture? 
I think if we are going to be shaped by Scripture, it's going to change us. It's going to challenge us. It's going to challenge a lot of us to love our neighbor more than we want to. It's going to shape uh, the way that we, we care for other people. It's going to help me and you to be uh, people who are more prayerful, reliant on God, because we know we don't have it all together. If we're applying Scripture, it's going to change the way we think. Because if I'm really allowing Scripture to, to master me, then God is going to say sometimes things that I don't agree with. He's going to challenge me. If, if God only ever says things that you agree with, then you have manufactured that God. The God who wants to master us and challenge us. May we be shaped by the Scriptures, and maybe in creative ways that we had never thought before, that that would typify our group together. As a, as a church, that we're people who are, who are made by Scripture and, and shaped by it. May it be so. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for our brother Paul. And we, we pray that we'll be people of the Word. We'll be shaped by your Word. May it be so. More and more, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, the first Sunday of every month, we take communion together. And it's our privilege to celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Everyone who humbly trusts in Christ and desires his help, may, and that he can lead them in a holy life, everyone who is truly sorry for their sins and would be delivered from them, everyone who would walk in love with their neighbors and intend to live a new life, following the commandments of God and walking from now on in his holy ways, uh, all those people are invited to draw near in faith and receive the holy sacrament. Let's take as a moment of silence as we prepare to come to the Lord's table, to reflect on our reasons of thanksgiving and our faith, our need of forgiveness and of more love. Then in our time of silence, let's remember our Lord Jesus Christ, who called us to share this meal together and thoughtfully examine the state of our faithfulness and our unity with his body. Take a few moments. If you'll rise and we can recite together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. You may be seated. Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, blessed forever, to you be praise and honor for giving yourself, shedding your blood, and letting your body be broken in death for our sake. If our, if our service could come forward, please. So that we might have the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. Bless, O oh God, this bread which we together will eat and this cup which together we will drink. Let us, through this blessed bread and this blessed cup, become partakers of our Savior Jesus Christ. Unite us with one another and with all of your saints throughout history and around the world. Consecrate us, body and soul, to be a living, acceptable offering to you, so that in word and deed we may continually praise and glorify your holy name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. This is Christ's body broken for you and Christ's blood shed for you. If you are new here, we take communion a little bit differently. You come forward in groups of maybe like six or eight and take it together. And uh, there are going to be three stations in the front, one in the back, and one person who's going to roam around if you uh, are not able to go to those places. And I, I want to remind you, too, if, if your line is a little long, you can go take the shorter line, like at the grocery store. Thank you. <laughs> That's where it should be.
Well, we're going to close this morning with one last song together, um, Lay Me Down. And before we do that, just to we do want to remind you guys, we do have baskets in the back and also just the back. If, you would, uh, if you'd like to give with us this morning, if you want to drop in prayer requests, connect cards, anything like that, that basket is there for you. Um, really just following everything Kurt said this morning, let's uh, stand together and sing this song. Um, this last song, Lay Me Down. Again, the lyrics of this chorus, simple, but very profound. I lay me down. I'm not my own. I belong to you alone. Lay me down. Lay me down. Hand on my heart, this much is true. There's no life apart from you. Lay me down. Lay me down. Let's close singing this together.
uh, want to remind you we have a hangout tonight at the, at the alley. If you'd like to join us between 5 and 7, look for a group out there. And I'm going to send you with, with a blessing. May, may your life increasingly be centered on Scripture. It will challenge you and comfort you, rebuke you, move you toward God. That we will, we will, you will clamor for the living God. You will want more and more of him in your life. May it be so this week, we pray in his name. Amen. Have a great week, everyone.